Can you tell me a little bit about finding the shooting location for that? Yeah, I, I wanted Green Inferno to look and feel like a dangerous movie. You know, I remember those old films, Inferno Herzog with Fitzcarraldo, or Apocalypse Now, or even Apocalypto, uh, and certainly the Italian cannibal films, Ruggiero Deodato and Berto Lenzi, where you watch these movies and you think, whoever made this movie is absolutely insane. Like, how could you have taken a movie camera there, and a crew, and actors, and shot? And I thought, you couldn't really do a movie like that today because the Amazon's disappearing. I thought, oh my God, that's it. That's the story I want to tell. But to find it, I really had to go there. I said, if I'm going to have a movie, you know, on the shelf at the video store, because in my mind, those still exist. Um, you know, if you're going to be in the iTunes section, you're going to be next to those other movies, you've got, you've got to be able to compete on that level. It's got to look and feel real. It's, you have to really go there. You can't just fake it in Hawaii or on a stage. So I went with my producer, Miguel Asensio, uh, who's from Spain, and uh, Gustavo Sanchez, who's from Peru. And he produced, Gustavo and Miguel worked together. Um, and we just went to Peru and we got in a boat and just went up the river. And literally, it was like Apocalypse Now. I mean, we were just going through the jungle. And it looks just like Aguirre, The Wrath of God, like those old Herzog movies. It hasn't changed at all. They call it the Pongo Aguirre, the nickname is, because that is where they shot Aguirre, The Wrath of God. And we just went for hours and hours up the river until I saw this straw hut. I said, what is that? And they're like, oh, it's some Pueblo. So we pull over and there's a little girl who's washing clothes, kind of looks up. They get visitors probably, you know, like, like that, just you know, once a year, not very often. And they looked at us and I said, my God, this, this looks perfect. Like it really, it's like there's straw huts and hammocks. Like we could, this could be the location. This is a, a real village. I said, can we shoot here? And Gustavo said, okay, but first we, we could, but we have to explain to the village what a movie is. Because most of these people have never left the village, so they've never seen a television before. Um, it turns out the girl who was washing clothes, we cast her as one of the leads. She's the one who was helping Lorenzo escape with the flute, Tati. Um, but the Peruvian producers went back like a week later, and they brought a television and a generator, and they called us, and they said, guess what, we bring news to the village, we show them a movie, and they voted and they're gonna let you shoot there. And I said, amazing, what did, what did you show them, Frozen or Star Wars? And they said, Cannibal Holocaust. And I was like, you showed those, what about the, the kids? You showed them, they're like, no, 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 don't worry, everybody saw it, they thought it was a comedy. So the whole village sat around and watched Cannibal Holocaust and they all voted and they said they want to be in the movie and everybody wanted to be a cannibal, they all signed up. And I asked, why would you show them something so violent? And they, they were smart, they said, we want them to know we're shooting, like this is worst case scenario. So we wanted to give them an idea of how to act and what we wanted, but, they loved it. And what was their opinion about the story? Were they like, you know, you shouldn't portray us like that or, any, or anything along those lines? The thing is that the people in Peru, the people in the villagers, they, they're so, storytelling is a big part of their tradition. So even though they had never seen a movie before, um, they understood that it was just pretend. And they thought it was hilarious. Like literally nobody in the village, I mean there were certain people that didn't want to participate in the making of the movie, but they understood that it was just a story. They understood that it was just pretend. And how is it for you? Is it like life imitating art in a way? Signing on and then just hopping on a plane like that and going into that kind of terrain? Yeah, I mean it was great because of what you said since I kind of had the same <laughs> arc as Justine. I had never been to the jungle and I was kind of going, oh my god, adventure, yes. And so it's like awesome, fun. And it was fun, but not until you're there and the, it's like 140 degrees and the bugs are killing you and you just, you just want to go home. But even though, you know, I just keep saying it, the biggest curse of like the crazy conditions of the jungle was, was again the biggest blessing because you had so much to work with. And to add to the villagers and the people that we worked with, they were phenomenal. I mean, they honestly thought we were crazy that we got to dress up and play pretend for a living and got paid for that. They just thought that was ridiculous. And we had a blast. We got, uh, we kind of created like a community. It was like summer camp in a way. We were all kind of naked and painted in different colors and, you know, just having a blast and I speak Spanish so I was able to really share you know my experience and what I you know have gone through with them and they told me what they had it was like a very kind of wake-up call and reality of like oh wow it is great to actually sit down and have a conversation with a human being without being on my phone every two seconds so I had very much a parallel arc to my character I just seen how much of what they're doing on screen besides like mutilating and eating people do they really do like how much does the film reflect their lifestyle and culture not at Nothing. all everyone in the movie's acting you know what's so funny about them is they're, they're not an actual tribe they're a, it's a community of farmers so once it's interesting once they put on like t-shirts and shorts but there were a lot of t-shirts that kind of made its way to the village that the Who's like that? like like one guy was in a utah jazz shirt and i was like do you have the utah jazz but he'd never seen basketball he didn't know what the utah jazz was but they're just clothes that had kind of made their way 
to that village. Um, no, they have a school. And but a they church. have a school and a church, and it's not like a, they're un. Civilized, like we, you know, we help build a kitchen for the school. We gave them like radios and digital cameras and batteries. Electricity is now coming to the village. They were really happy to have appliances that they could use because nobody had any. Um, but it was interesting, you know, after there was something very symbolic, the last day of shooting, you know, we got the last shot with the kids and everyone's like, oh, yeah, and the kids are in the cage and they're screaming. And then I yelled cut and this rainstorm came in and just washed everyone away and all the Wow, that must off. have been a scheduling and then there nightmare. Was a, was there was a double rainbow. Every, and that was Peru. Though. Every five seconds you'd be shooting at sunny and then there's a rainstorm. There was no again. scheduling. You just had to work with nature. Yeah. I can't tell what's more daunting. The thought that it could rain any second or working in a place like that without electricity. Yeah, well, it was crazy. I mean, we, we was five hours of traveling every day. We all had to pack overnight bags just in case we got stuck in the village so everybody did that ever happen it almost no, did it almost there was one did. day one day there was a flood in the the andes two days away and the river rose i actually thought sorry sorry no i was saying like the river rose and it was terrifying like the, there there was beach that was there before where their brought was completely washed away the water was up to the trees and i remember there's this one turn in the rapids that was always a little dodgy and that one i was really nervous we weren't going to make it and that the boats were going to flip but i actually thought there was another location i hate it way more like working in the village it was really tough to get there because it was so isolated but it was fun to work with the people and it for me, the hardest location by far was one that we called the Hell Hole. That was on the way, it was kind of near the village, but you didn't need to go on the river to get there. And it was this construction site, and since it was so hot and humid, it would rain, the mud was really hard to like walk on, so there were some scenes that you would walk and just fall on your face in the mud. And it was impossible. It was just, it was it hell. It was really hard. Because there was the bugs coming was, from the mist of the yeah. mud, and then it would rain, and then the heat cut. It was just awful. The yeah, hell hole. there was no escaping the hell hole. And it was also covered in tarantulas. So, yeah. like, Daryl Sabar was terrified of tarantulas, and they were. They yeah. were is that, is that why he gets that scene in the movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. And then. When we had Lorenza, and when all the kids are chained to the trees for the protest. That, that, that's the location we're talking about, yeah. the protest scene. The protest scene, scene um, we had to smoke out the trees because they're covered in Azula ants. And if you get bit by one of these, it's like a gunshot for 24 hours. It's not. Apparently their venom is the single, there's nothing more painful than a bite from an Azula ant. And they were all over the tree where we were about to chain Lorenza, so we had to basically smoke out the tree and lay fires to to scare away the ants. Was so, there like, ever anything hours. on this where you're like, maybe we're going too far with something? Every day, like there was, yeah. it was really, we didn't get insurance until we left Peru. Once we were out of the Amazon, How nobody would insure us. How did get insurance for this? We well, did it. We did it. We, th they, we kept saying like, is the insurance coming through? And they're like, yeah, 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 don't worry. It's I, in the fax machine. I just, I, I still wonder where that medic was. I, I don't think there was a medic. <laughs> so medic. Oh, I mean, it was one of those things where, like, we had the scene of Lorenzo where she goes to the river and she takes a step and boom, goes underneath and pops up in the middle of the river. And, of course, we went there one day. We figured out all the shots. We go back the next day and it's completely washed out by the river. There's, it's just gone. That's just happened all the time. So we had to improvise and figure, okay, so now we'll do it. You Found fall in here. Spot. Now you go on that rock. And she almost drowned. I mean, that the current was so strong. So when she's screaming in that scene, she's really screaming for her life. So there were a few moments. And then when she gets into a scene with her in a helicopter, and then there was a storm, and the helicopter almost went down. Like it was, it was yeah. scary. How know? much did you two work together before you shot this? Because you shot this. Oh, this was 2013, 12. We shot it three years ago. Sold it in 2013. We had worked before Green Inferno. We had worked on um, Hemlock Grove. As oh, the and opening actress. scene, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. And I remember before this. that, we had worked as actor and actor in um, Aftershock. All so right. we had done a couple of projects before. You know. Can you tell me a little bit about working with him as an actor's director, especially having done this and Knock Knock, which mm -hmm. I imagine were two entirely different experiences? Yeah, I mean, they've, it's interesting. They've all been very different. You know, Aftershock was shot in my country, and it was my first time doing an English-speaking movie. And he was an actor, too, so we were kind of on the same sort of team. I mean, we always are. And then we went from that, I moved to LA and I um, started working there and I got, and he gave me the opportunity to work on Hemlock Grove and he was a director and all of a sudden there was this massive, huge production of Netflix that I was like, oh my God, this is so scary. There's like 300 people, you know, I wasn't used to it. So it was so nice to have a, a hand to sort of, and a, a person I knew to sort of, you know, um, coach me through it. And then by the time we got to Green Inferno, I was like, yes, game on. You know, it's, it's so nice to work with someone that knows you very well and that can 
push you farther than you think you can push yourself and it can also really guide you and at the same time as a friend so all those things combined together make like the perfect director so I love working with him. Are there any specific scenes in either movie where you're like I don't know if I could do this now you look at them oh and you're like God. that was well worth so it. Many. <laughs> it's funny there's so many scenes that I'm like why did he do that to me I hate him where I would like literally <laughs> wanted to like kill him but I'm so happy he did that I mean the one there's the one in Hemlock Grove where I get eaten by that werewolf was really tough to shoot he really pushed me in that one he's very intense <laughs> and then in Green Inferno the protest scene and it came out amazing so I, I, I really trust him how was it shooting at Columbia at the beginning were they the o- were they okay with exactly yeah, what actually, you wanted to do I kind of did a trade off with Columbia where I was like I'll teach I'll talk to the film class and the film school <laughs> there Columbia was fantastic you know I always wanted to shoot there I, I I grew up in the East Coast and went to NYU, and I remember going and visiting my friends at Columbia, and I was like, wow, this is where the smart kids go to school. <laughs> yeah. we like, and it looks like Spider-Man. It you was know, my she, chance to go to Con- Ivy yeah. League School of Zero. <laughs> yeah, and her best friend was at Columbia, so she could spend time with him and, and study. So um, I loved shooting there. You know, I wanted the locations I wanted. For me, Columbia was Zabar's, Cornet Pizza, and Columbia University. And the fact that we were able to get all three was like a dream come true. Like, that is the New York movie. That was such my college experience going to those spots. You visit your friend at Columbia and you, like, drink and you get pizza at 2 in the morning. Hungarian pastry sleep shop. Sleep all night. Like, yeah, <laughs> go to the Hungarian <laughs> pastry shop. shop yeah. Then you're, like, drunk and you get the pizza. Beer <laughs> and then you go and then you get cornet pizza. And then, you know, you go to Zabar's the next morning. And Zabar, luckily, the guy was an Glorious Bastards fan. And very cool to let us shoot there because they're like, we don't even let Woody Allen shoot here. We're letting you because you're the bear too. That pretty much sums up life at Columbia. Yeah, and, that was it. <laughs> and, it, and it also gives you such production value. You know, getting to shoot there for those for those days, like you just put the camera anywhere and it just looks like it. Yeah, and that's it was I like wanted. a real movie. All it was a real movie. Like, wow. My best. I got. I I used the opportunity to sort of like I would. I really wanted to make portray Justine as a real person. So I went. I had. I was lucky enough. My best friend was actually studying philosophy and economy at Columbia. So I went and slept and lived with him and shattered him. And it was just like he come. He came one day to like see a shooting. I was like, oh my god, there's you shooting a real movie. And it was like, yes. Yeah. So it fi- it finally felt like we're like, oh, this is this is. Our- I don't. <laughs> In New York. Um, it was great. I remember the first day Louis C.K. walked by, and, yeah. and I knew him for years, like 20 years ago. And he's like, Eli, man, it's so cool. I was like, wow, we got the thumbs up from Louis C.K. It was really, it was, it was great. surreal. It was surreal. And, yeah. I, and I watch it now. I mean, for me, the whole idea is I wanted the beginning of the movie to look like Spider Man or You've Got Mail or like a very controlled, beautiful New York with fall and your coffee, and there's yellow taxi cabs and scarves and cashmere sweaters. Yeah, the yellow taxi cabs. And then cab. at the end, by the time they get to the village after the plane crash, it's like you're in some horrible, terrifying. Room handheld documentary covered in mud and you know everything's blurry and out of focus like like you feel like the film has lost control after the plane crashes That's it's also wanted. awesome because having gone to school there and the controlled environment and then going down there all I kept thinking about is just how I would feel if I left like my comfortable lifestyle it just made seeing people covered in mud and that uncomfortable like well, you even, went to Columbia I did it's the best and you caught Dodge Hall in the background at one point I, I greatly appreciated that <laughs> yeah no there's certain areas that let you shoot in Columbia and a big, big, big thank you to Columbia University because for yeah. me, you couldn't fake like the, the Italian cannibal movies of the 70s and 80s, they have this classic formula. They always start in New York City, then they go off to the Amazon, then they kind of, the button is in New York City. So, uh, you know, getting to shoot there and having those big wide shots of the building was just, it was, it looks, the movie looks and feels so much bigger when you see it. But yeah. I remember that. I remember when I went, um, when I was a freshman at NYU and I went up to Columbia and I was visiting my friend, and there were these like two girls that were starving themselves in the lawn. I was like, "What's going on?" They're like, "There's a hunger protest." I was like, "What is this?" And they're like, "Well, the girls are starving themselves because the janitors don't have health insurance." And I was like, well, "Why are they starving themselves?" I was like, because they need a cause. I was like, "Really?" He's like, "Well, the theory is that they have eating disorders. Now, if they do a hunger protest, then no one can accuse them of having an eating disorder." I was like, "That is so dark," and yet kind of on point at the same time. So I just, that always stuck with me. That was like a thing that I remember from when I was 18 years old. So that's why I started the protest. You know, all these, at college you get there and you want a cause, you want to do something, so you're gonna protest this, so and okay. hunger strike for the janitors, and jan- you know, going against the 1%. It's like things you do when you're a student. And also just the thrill of it. Like I could totally relate to that idea of feeling so comfortable, and then just like, need, regardless of what the cause is, just needing to pick up and go and like and break a race. Break. completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Everyone I can remember I had, a, I had a roommate, this was so dark, he was really funny. Um, he went to, I remember him going, putting on 
a, like a pink triangle pin because this was like the silence equals death era of like of, of like gay rights. He put on a pink triangle pin and he went out to like a gay rights rally. I was like, "What are you doing?" He's like, "I'm gonna go pick up girls." I was like, "What?" So he has like the, the gay <laughs> rights pin and he starts talking to like the hottest girl and he's like cheering. She starts turning and talking to him and then she said to him, she was like. So what do you, you know, when did you come out? And he's like, I'm sorry, what do you mean? And she goes, well, when did you, you're out. When, you know, I see your pin. When did you come out? Was it difficult for you? He goes, I'm not gay, I'm straight. And she goes, oh my God, but you're, you're wearing that pin. He goes, well, that doesn't mean I can't support gay rights. And she goes, oh, you're so secure with your masculinity that you can support gay rights. And you're, and what he, year was <laughs> this was like 92, 93. And he just I was, can't remember that working now. <laughs> 30 minutes later, he was like having sex with her. And I was like, that is, that is so genius and dark, dark, like using activism just like as this cause just to go ever. just to go and meet girls. Like I just think there's something about like I mean for me the kids in Green Inferno, the whole thing came about this kind of new activism that you can call slacktivism or clicktivism or reactivism, where the kids everybody wants to be the trending hashtag. It's not even about the cause, it's about getting followers. So whether it's it started with Coney 2012 and this Twitter shaming of like, what's wrong with you? You Hollywood a-hole, you didn't tweet the video. Don't you care about child soldiers? Then a month later, free Pussy Riot. Wait, you didn't tweet about Pussy Riot. Don't, you must be pro-Putin. You must be anti-freedom of speech. And then bring back our girls. Like, what's wrong with you? Don't you care about Boko Haram? These girls have been kidding. Every week there's there's a new cause. And, every, and then the Ice Bucket Challenge, which everything starts as a good cause. And soon it's like, Ice Bucket Challenge, a.k.a. look how hot I look in my underwear. See my six pack? It's like everyone is this vanity activism. So the kids in Green Inferno, they're not, it's not like they're happy. When they shut down the protest, they're a mess. They're crying, so they went out of there. But when they're trending on when they're trending on Twitter, they're like high-fiving, clicking beers. And then they made the homepage of Reddit, and they're like, that's it, game over. We made the front page of Reddit. So that's what it's about. It's about how, you know, I think there's a whole generation now, that, or there's a wave of people that, like, causes start as very good things, and I to totally believe in using Twitter and social activism, but people capitalize on it. To, they want to kind of, it's, it's not even about the cause anymore, it's about getting credit for the cause. And so that's what her character has to face at the end, is does she care about saving these people, or does she care about credit for saving this these people? This is a very interesting decision, too. I like that. Yeah.